Hi guys, this is Mr. Roxy coming to July from Palm Beach in Florida. What we are going to do this evening, and I say this evening because it is March 18th, which is Thursday evening, 2021, and it is approximately quarter to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are going to look at the intelligent investor, and I am going to provide you with some bedtime reading. So uh, if you were to be easily bored by um, someone reading to you from a book, um, then perhaps you wouldn't want to watch this video. Alternatively, what you could do, do is um, you could wait for a couple of hours until it's your bedtime, wherever in the world you might uh, currently find yourself, and say, hey, you know what? I will listen to the soothing, calming voice of Mr. Oxy as a bedtime story to help me get to sleep. But more specifically, what I want to do is talk about chapter 16, Convertible Issues and Warrants. And more specifically, I want to talk about Occidental Petroleum's warrants and how it might relate to this brilliant book by Benjamin Graham. And this is all prompted by a uh, request from Alexei Volsky, who uh, is in Moscow in Russia, who asked me a few days ago, he said, it would be interesting to hear your opinion on Wall Street's advice never to convert a convertible. Now, Alexei, to be fair, in Benjamin Graham's day, uh, this was uh, the book, the first edition of the book was written in the 1940s. Um, you know, there were a lot of things that we know today that didn't exist in those days, like for instance, the internet, never mind Wall Street bets and Reddit. So uh, things were a little different then to what they are today. However, we always had convertible um, instruments that were, we were able to convert into cash or common stocks or whatever the case might be. In Benjamin's, uh, Benjamin Graham's day, these were primarily bonds, but it doesn't matter because the premise pretty much remains the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually gonna read you a couple of uh, little excerpts from the book and uh, provide some commentary as we go. So uh, that's the plan, guys, and I hope I don't put you to sleep. So guys, this is my well-worn out copy of The uh, Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. Uh, and I have the fourth edition in my hand. Um, this is uh, certainly uh, referred to by many people as the investor's Bible. Um, and uh, you know, it's quite a big book, but at the same time, it's quite an easy read. Um, on the cover, it says the definitive book on value investing. The neat thing about it is it's written in a language that almost anyone can understand. So if you don't like reading, uh, you know, because it takes up too much of your time or you just don't enjoy it, you can always buy a copy of this book and then you can just leave, read little bits of it every now and then. What I want to do first is just read you a very short little sentence, which is the preface to this uh, fourth edition, which was written by Warren Buffett. And he writes, to invest successfully over a lifetime does not require a stratospheric IQ unusual business insight or inside information. What's needed is a sound intellectual framework for making decisions and the ability to keep emotions from corroding that framework. This book precisely and clearly prescribes the proper framework, but you must supply the emotional, emotional discipline. And especially on a day like today, uh, you know, for an energy investor uh, like myself, I've mentioned this before to you, uh, somewhat in jest, kind of uh, tongue in cheek. You know, uh, it's one Maserati, two Maserati, three Maserati. And uh, today is one of those days when I say like, how many Maseratis did I lose on paper? But I don't get too emotional about it because what I actually do is I change my mindset to say, is this a day for me to uh, add to some of my existing positions? And if so, which ones and when? Uh, I chatted with Bulldogs about this because he shared some of the bad news with me about COVID and Biden and Russia and all kinds of things. And um, alluding to the fact that this might want to be one of the reasons why energy tanked today and WTI actually momentarily dropped below uh, $60 a barrel before it kind of uh, popped up again, uh, just a little bit towards the end of the day. Anyway, what I want to talk about specifically is this chapter over here, which is what Alexi had asked me about. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is chapter 16, Convertible Issues and Warrants. Why do we want to talk about warrants? Because remember last year in July, Occidental issued some warrants. What exactly are warrants? Well, we talked about this before, so I'm not going to go into the definition of warrants. You can actually look in my library for, for uh, some uh, information about Occidental warrants if you don't know how they are or how they work. 
but here's uh, Benjamin Graham's take on warrants. They are a fabrication in more than one sense. That's the preview, guys. So let's see where we go in, in this particular story. You cannot make a mere ingenious device that makes a bargain much better for both sides. In exchange for the conversion privilege, the investor usually gives up something important in quality or yield or both. Cannot be a good deal for both sides. An investment may offer the best of one world or the worst of another, but the best of both worlds seldom becomes available in a single package. The reason why it says that is because when warrants were first introduced by uh, companies like AT&T, people said, oh, this is a win-win. Well, it very, very seldom is a win-win. So talking about Occidental warrants, uh, just for a moment there, um, if you had followed my story, you would have known that I was issued about, um, I think it was about 380, let's call it 400 warrants uh, in uh, July of last year. Uh, I almost accidentally exited my warrants by uh, plugging in a trailing stock to protect my gains when they were up quite a lot and ended up selling them all at about um, $7. So let's make the math easy and let's say it was 400 warrants at seven bucks, it's $2,800 at the time. I said like, okay, I'll just view it as, a, as a, an Occidental petroleum dividend, the $2,800. Uh, Occidental was trading at about $18 at the time. And uh, I immediately purchased uh, 400 shares. I think it was actually 380, but anyway, I immediately purchased uh, 380 shares or whatever the number was and used the uh, $3,000 um, dividend that I had received, which was actually the cash I received for my warrants as a discount against the purchase of my shares, which meant my, per my uh, uh, share purchase um, cost basis was about $12 approximately. So point number one, Alexi, and for anyone else who's listening, uh, I converted my, um, my warrants into cash. And this particular chapter in the Bible says, never convert a convertible. As Graham warns, convertible securities always come out of the woodwork near the end of a bull market, largely because even poor quality companies then have stock returns high enough to make the conversion feature seem attractive. Uh, what I've done, by the way, I've, I've just highlighted a couple of lines and that's what I'm reading to you. So uh, as I said at the start, I hope I don't put you to sleep while I do this. Convertible preferred stock, which made up roughly half of the convertible market in Graham's day, now accounts for only an eighth of the market. So um, it's not as popular today as what it was um, 70 years ago when this was written. The addition of the conversion privilege often, perhaps generally, betrays the ab absence of genuine investment quality for the issue. In other words, Graham is assuming that um, anyone who issues warrants does not have a genuine investment quality issue, in this case, Occidental Petroleum stock. A convertible preferred is safer than common stock of the same company. Well, of course, we know Warren has the uh, or Berkshire Hathaway has the preferreds. That is to say, it carries a smaller risk of the eventual loss of principal. That's just stacking in terms of risk, right? The uh, common shareholders are basically at the bottom of the uh, of the line, or at the end of the line, at the back of the line, when it comes to uh, uh, risk from the point of view that uh, there are some people who get their money first, you know, like the IRS, and common stockholders get their money last if there's anything left should the company fail. A good deal of the buying of convertibles was done by investors who had no special interest or confidence in the common stock. That is, they would never have thought of buying the common at the time. We've seen that today with uh, Occidental Petroleum's warrants. Many people have just uh, pretty much traded or otherwise just bought the warrants. Um, there are exceptions. Coral Icahn is an exception. Uh, you know, at the time uh, Occidental issued the warrants, um, uh, Icahn owned uh, about 100 million shares. And he uh, proceeded to buy several million um, warrants at the same time, sort of trading them. Even when a, when a profit appears, it brings a dilemma with it. Should the holder sell on a small rise, which basically is what I did. I just told you that. Should he hold on for a much bigger advance if the issue is called? As so, happen, uh, as, as so often happens when the common has gone up considerably, should he sell out then or convert it into and retain common stock? 
that is your choice. If you own Oxygenal Warrant, at this moment in time, you can convert them anytime into common stock uh, for a price of $22. And of course, if you got the warrants for free, uh, you still have to pay $22 for the common stock. So the question is, if you have not converted it yet, what are you waiting for? Um, or otherwise, if you say, I'm never going to convert them, uh, sooner or later, they, you're either going to sell them for cash, which means you're converting them to cash, or otherwise you're just going to exit the position. Um, you know, uh, and and that might be because the uh, the warrants have uh, gone their full vesting term and uh, terminated, and they are worthless. Because of the extraordinary length of the 1950 to 1968 18 year bull market, convertible issues as a whole gave a good account of themselves. But this only meant that the great majority of common stocks enjoyed large advances in which most convertible issues were able to share. In other words, the one pulled the other along. So in this particular example he's using here, he's, he's saying in this bull market, which lasted about 18 years, the rise in the stock price actually just pulled the uh, convertible issues along. In this case, uh, we can make it applicable to Occidental's warrants. The soundness of investment in convertible issues, direct investment in the convertible, so in the warrants, can only be tested by their performance in a declining stock market. And this, has always proved disappointing as a whole. I didn't look at uh, Occidental's warrants today. I know Occidental was down, uh, I think it was like seven, eight percent or something like that, but uh, I didn't look at the actual prices. I, I'm, I'm just uh, giving you some news here. I'm, I, I tend to, uh, as you know by now, uh, this is about as excited as I get. So um, I don't get too emotional when it comes to my uh, stock trades, except for the fact that, um, you know, one Maserati, two Maserati. The old maxim of Wall Street runs, never convert a convertible bond. Why this advice? Because once you convert, you've lost your strategic combination of prior claimant to interest plus a chance for an attractive profit. That's on the convertible. Of course, in, in, uh, in a sort of normal world as it relates to Oxy, uh, you can easily convert the convertible, which is the warrant, into common stock um, based on the assumption that you were going to earn a dividend. But uh, as we know from experience now, that no longer holds true. Never convert a convertible is a good rule. How it came that these experienced fund managers exchanged their ever sharp bonds for stock. At the start, I said it was mo mostly related to bonds in uh, Graham's day. To their subsequent embarrassing loss, the answer is no doubt that they let themselves be carried away by enthusiasm for the company's prospects as well as by the favorable market action of the shares. A classic example of do as I say and not as I do. This last sentence could serve as the epitaph for the bull market of the 1990s. This is a comment uh, from one of the authors uh, who wrote the, um, the, the uh, latest edition that I have, who added some comments. Among the few prudent principles that investors forgot were such market cliches as trees do not grow to the sky. And the one that we hear quite often, even from Jim Cramer, which is bulls make money, bears make money, but pigs get slaughtered. Nearly done, guys. This is a short chapter. An investor should look more than twice before he buys convertibles. So in other words, look more than twice before you buy Occidental warrants. The ideal combination, of course, is a strongly secured convertible exchangeable for common stock, which is in itself attractive and at a price only slightly higher than the current market. I'm going to add a little comment there and say, um, if you were thinking of converting your uh, Occidental warrants to common stock, you probably want to do it um, sort of uh, in an environment of around $22, which is the strike price on the warrants. Um, but that's, you know, that, that varies from uh, investor to investor. So that's not advice, it's just a comment. To prove them sound in practice, we would need to have a number of instances in which the convertible worked out well even though the common stock proved disappointing, such instances are not easy to find. We have that situation right now where Occidental stock has been on a tear uh, up um, well over 100, almost 200% uh, over the last six months or so, depending on where your entry price was. But there are two offsetting factors, one of which is particularly or practically ignored and the other entirely so in optimistic markets. We are in an optimistic market. The first is the actual dilution of the current and future earnings on the common stock that flows arithmetically from the new conversion rights. 
Of course, every time someone exercises warrant, Occidental is actually issuing stock, which means there's a dilution. This dilution can be quantified by taking the recent earnings or assuming some other figures and calculating the adjusted earnings per share if all the convertible shares or bonds were actually converted. We consider a recent development of stock option warrants as near fraud. So this was Benjamin Graham's biggest hassle and challenge that he had with um, convertibles. They have created huge aggregate dollar values out of thin air. They have no excuse for existence except to the extent that they mislead speculators and investors. They should be prohibited by law or at least strictly limited to a minor part of the total capitalization of the company. Strong words, huh? Well, it kind of uh, sums up for you what uh, Benjamin Graham's thoughts were as it relates to uh, convertibles, just that last paragraph that I read. If you need to, you can always rewind and uh, just listen to that again. Uh, and just to close off here, when separate warrants are issued for the right to subscribe additional capital, so that action takes away part of the value inherent in an ordinary common share and transfers it to a separate certificate. That's the comment that he made about creating some kind of value out of thin air. They do not realize that the common stock is now worth less with warrants outstanding than otherwise, than otherwise would have been the case. Hence the package of stocks and warrants usually commands a better price in the market than with the stock alone. Note that in the usual company reports, the per share earnings are or have been computed without proper allowance for the effect of the outstanding warrants. The result is, of course, to overstate the true relationship between the earnings and the market value of the company's capitalization. I'm gonna wrap it up there. Um, and uh, Alexi, I, I'm, I'm gonna suggest that um, it's very difficult for anyone to disagree with uh, Benjamin Graham because the guy's an absolute genius when it comes to investing. In fact, uh, at one stage, Warren Buffett told the story about how he asked Benjamin Graham if he could work for Benjamin Graham, or he being Warren, could work for Benjamin Graham for free. And Benjamin Graham replied, no, because your asking price is too high. So uh, that kind of gives you an indication of how, uh, in what great esteem Benjamin Graham is held within the industry. Never convert a convertible, uh, you know, the only examples that I have uh, related to, uh, to to converting convertibles relates to my own uh, previous experiences where I've converted a variety of different instruments uh, into cash or otherwise into stocks. And some of them were uh, stock options, some of them were warrants, etc. So I've done this a few times. Uh, so it would be very hypocritical for me to say never convert a convertible. On a much lighter note, um, I did learn of a uh, Mustang, a Ford Mustang 65 model, which came standard with a uh, three-speed automatic gearbox where the um, transmission was converted to a four-speed manual because the uh, automatic gearbox was not very good. That car was a convertible too. So uh, in the context of uh, just being a little bit lighthearted, sometimes it's worthwhile converting a convertible. Alexi, I'm not sure if I'm helping you uh, either up a ladder or down into a deeper hole. Uh, when uh, a very smart guy like Benjamin Graham says, do not convert a convertible uh, ever, uh, that might be good advice. I'm not sure if it's applicable today uh, in 2021. Uh, I'm not going to assume uh, or suggest that his uh, advice is out of date, uh, but I would not be surprised to even see uh, geniuses of the modern time or more, more modern time like Carl Icahn somewhere along the line either convert these convertibles into common stock or cash. So on that happy note, this is Mr. Oxy signing off and uh, sleep well. Have a great day and uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.